listen so yes i was sauce you know the deal yeah back with another video for the feels okay so stick around to the end for the vibes go ahead and drop a like then you might as well subscribe sweet and sour sauce is in the building yes yes all right you already know the deal if you're new here my name is sweet welcome to the channel appreciate you stopping in and for my subscribers you there's something different about you you have like this aura or something that's just emanating off of you is it is that is that sauce no <laughs> sorry <laughs> all right so welcome back to another sunday with sauce if you're new here this is week eight of the series where i review everything god has taught me throughout the week in the hopes of maybe helping someone else come to know him the way that i do so first we're going to review the five chapters i read this past week and what messages i received from the word and then we're going to go over the sermon at my church from this past week and review all the fundamental lessons in that as well sounds like a plan let's get it so this past week, I read Leviticus chapter 6 through 10. God delivers more commands concerning burnt offerings and Moses' brother Aaron and his sons become inaugurated as priests. Within these chapters, we also see how God handles disobedience to his commands. Leviticus chapter 8 verses 34 through 35, the Lord commanded what has been done today in order to make atonement for you. You must remain at the entrance to the tent of meeting day and night for seven days and keep the Lord's charge so that you will not die, for this is what I commanded. Aaron and his sons were warned because disobedience to God's word would meet with death. And unfortunately, we see an example of this in chapter 10. After sacrificing their offerings to God, the Israelites witnessed the glory of the Lord appear before them. Fire came from God as he consumed the burnt offering his way of showing that he accepted the sacrifice. But then Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, make a grave mistake. Each took his own fire pan, put fire in it, placed incense on it, and presented unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them to do. Then fire came from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. The same divine fire that accepted the sacrifices consumed the priests. They were guilty of violating both requirements of God's absolute standard. He says in verse 3, I must be regarded as holy to those who are near me, and I must be glorified before all the people. Nadab and Abihu betrayed their solemn duty to do as God commanded, and they had also received previous warnings about the necessity of reverence before God. Back in Exodus, God says, Even the priests who come near the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out in anger against them. So unfortunately, God had to make an example out of Nadab and Abihu for all priests to see as a warning. But what I love the most about this chapter is Aaron's response after the death of his sons. After the Lord spoke through Moses in verse three, the very next line says, and Aaron remained silent. In spite of losing two sons, Aaron didn't complain, object, or say anything at all. He instead submitted to the righteous judgment of God. His silence was so moving to me because in the midst of anguish, he still held his respect for our God. The disobedience ensues later in the chapter though, as Moses discovers Aaron and his remaining sons did not eat the sin offering as they were told. Moses says, for it is especially holy and he has assigned it for you to take away the guilt of the community and make atonement for them before the Lord. Aaron reasons that he was too dejected to feast after the loss of his sons, and Moses sympathized with Aaron, dropping the issue entirely. We don't see any punishment from the Lord in this chapter, but that doesn't change the fact that Aaron was wrong in disobeying God. God's law was clear and it was a sin to deviate from it at all. When I read about God inflicting his wrath upon people, it just fills me with gratitude. Knowing that sin is in our nature, just thinking of God striking me down like that from something stupid I did is terrifying. And we're blessed with so much love that Jesus suffered a horrible death to prevent us from experiencing God's wrath, redeeming us who are undeserving and just bound to do stupid things. Okay, so let's transition to some pastoral teachings now. This past week's sermon was the beginning of the new Strangers in a Strange Land series in the book of 1 Peter, 
called Elect Exiles. In the first couple of verses of chapter 1 is the start of Peter's letter to a group of people suffering persecution he calls Elect Exiles. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. The main message Peter wants you to know from his letter is that the way you endure in the midst of any kind of persecution is to understand that you are in an elect exile. That's what it means to be a Christian, is to be an exile. And if there's anyone in Jesus' realm of relationships who's most qualified to talk about failure in the midst of persecution, it's Peter. The same Peter who dropped everything to follow Jesus that day on his boat. And also the same Peter whom Jesus told he'd deny him three times before the rooster crows. And he did. So to be in exile means living far away from your home in a strange or foreign land while still holding the values of your home. We are in a world that's alien to us. And just like every stranger in a strange land, we don't quite fit. We're exiles too. And Peter wants us to know that you might want to fit in culturally, but not morally. That morally, we're strangers in such a way that we don't run after the same things that society values. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 reads, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Don't conform to the ways of this world. We're not supposed to fit in. We're supposed to look different, to look morally weird. Sincerely following Jesus is going to make you look that way. So Peter's encouragement begins with us needing to accept the fact that we're exiles, but also we're elect. Elect is a theological term that means chosen, specifically to be chosen out of a group. And the word elect is a common synonym used for the word Christian in the New Testament. Titus 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect. Colossians 3 verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. John 15 verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So when you put all these testimonies from scripture together, it depicts that Christians are also called chosen ones. So God is specifically choosing people out of the group. But on what basis does he do this? Peter answers that question back in the first couple of verses according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. But what does that mean? The way people debate this foreknowledge of God is the one side thinks that foreknowledge means foresight, meaning that God chooses to grant salvation to those he foresees will respond well to the offer of salvation. The other view is that foreknowledge means to be foreloved. In the Bible, when the word knowledge is addressed to a person, like God knows so-and-so, or Adam knows Eve. It's used as a relational loving term, describing an intimacy between those people. To Israel, in Amos 3 verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. God knew who the Babylonians were, who the Syrians were, and what they did, but it was only Israel that God gave a covenant, loving relationship with. That's what it means to be loved by God. Back in 1 Peter, Referring to Jesus, it says, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. So that means I'm a Christian because God foreloved me. I'm chosen, elect, according to the foreknowledge, the forelove of God. Peter's encouragement is that even if we feel like we have no home in this world, we have a home in God. He chose us and loved us before the world was created wanting us and always wanting us forever. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So what Peter is trying to say in his letter 
is that I know life is hard and all sorts of difficulties are going to come, but you are an adopted child of God and amidst all the pain, he's telling you, you're mine. This is just a moment and it's leading exactly where I wanted to go. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? All right, that's a wrap, folks. Appreciate you watching the video. I hope you found some value in the things that we talked about today. And if you did, feel free to hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and share this video to somebody else who you think may need it or find value in it too. Much love. Appreciate the support as always. And I'm going to see y'all in the next one. Peace.